The story begins with an adventurer named Rent journeying through a dungeon. He is stunned when he comes face to face with a formidable, winged monster boasting impressively muscular bicep. The creature reveals a secondary mouth within its first one, sending Rent into a state of utter terror, realizing he might not survive this encounter. The monstrous creature, resembling a giant Digimon, advances towards Rent, who is trembling uncontrollably. Rent is in disbelief, as his dream of becoming a Mithril-class adventurer seems to be crumbling before his eyes. His situation worsens when the beast attacks him with both its mouths. After the attack, Rent is shocked to discover he's still alive, but even more astounding is that he's been transformed into a skeleton. Haunted by this horrifying transformation, Rent reminisces about his past when he was flesh and blood, blissfully unaware of his grim future. He used to start his days early, envying the luxurious lives of nobles and scholars who could sleep in. But little did he know, waking up early would soon become the least of his worries. Rent, a low bronze class adventurer, was raised in a small, obscure town. He relied on the Adventurer's Guild for jobs, which were assigned based on rank and skill to prevent unprepared adventurers from meeting untimely ends or turning into skeletons. The Guild offered a variety of tasks, from exciting monster hunts to mundane material gathering. Despite being approached by some unambitious adventurers, Rent decides to return to the labyrinth due to the lack of appealing jobs. His peers, preferring leisure activities like playing Fortnite, can't fathom Rent's dedication to his work. Rent prefers to adventure alone, not because of a solitary hero complex, but because he's simply not very skilled. Despite a decade of adventuring, he's still only at the second lowest rank. He scrapes by selling items from cautious jobs and lives of frugal life. His life, while uneventful, involves careful planning in every aspect. However, this caution is thrown to the wind when he stumbles upon a secret passage in a well-explored, deserted dungeon. Rent eagerly explores this newfound area, hoping to find magical treasures. His excitement grows as he realizes that even reporting this discovery to the guild could earn him a fortune. Rent fails to recognize the clear danger signs in a mysterious room. Here, he confronts what he believes is a dragon, the most formidable of all monsters. This dragon appears to have evolved into its ultimate form, emitting a presence so intense it paralyzes Rent, making him realize he stands no chance against this colossal dragon. Fast forward to the present, Rent is puzzled about how he's still alive after being devoured by the dragon. He's now just a skeleton, an immortal undead creature. Rent knows he's vulnerable to purification magic used by bishops or priests, as undead beings are unnatural in this world. Despite lacking a brain, Rent is deep in thought. He still has his consciousness and memories, suggesting he's alive in some way. He considers returning to town but fears being captured or executed. Confused about his existence, Rent decides to leave the dungeon and avoid his problems. As he leaves, Rent muses over the mysteries of labyrinths, their origins, and the treasures and dangers within. He plans to seek advice from adventurers coming to the dungeon, but realizes he must figure out how to speak without a tongue. Suddenly, a skeleton monster appears, and Rent prepares for battle. Struggling to move due to his skeletal form, he realizes his physical limitations. As a human, skeletons were easy to defeat, but now he struggles to lift his sword. In a moment of vulnerability, Rent discovers he can still use spirit energy, even as an undead. This boosts his physical ability, allowing him to crush his opponent. Surprisingly, defeating the skeleton lets Rent recover the spirit energy he used. The story then flashes back to a time when a woman taught Rent about monsters. She explains that they evolve with time and experience, becoming more formidable. This applies to humans too, who grow through training, but monsters evolve on a whole different level. She uses skeletons as an example of this mysterious evolutionary trait. Skeletons usually remain unchanged, but sometimes they evolve into ghouls through a process called existential evolution. Rent, now a skeleton, sees hope in this. Ghouls look somewhat human because they have flesh. He thinks if he becomes a ghoul, he could disguise himself with robes and masks and return to town without scaring people with his skeletal appearance. Feeling optimistic, Rent sets a new goal, defeat monsters in the labyrinth to evolve into a ghoul. Meanwhile, in town, Rent's friend is disappointed he hasn't returned and decides to make dinner alone. Back in the dungeon, Rent is making progress, having already defeated five skeletons. He's regained his mobility and discovered that light from defeated enemies heals him, allowing him to use spirit energy in each battle. Looking for stronger monsters, Rent encounters a slime. They're weak but tricky, as physical attacks don't work well on them. Rent, lacking offensive magic skills and able to only start fires, opts to attack with his sword. He knows slimes can be defeated by piercing their core or breaking them apart until they can't regenerate. Surprisingly, he manages to strike the slime's core, defeating it and taking a magic stone as a reward. 
He also collects slime ooze to sell later, as it's used in cosmetics. At the guild, two people discuss a newbie looking for a party. They consider recommending her to join Rent, but he's been absent. The newbie, needing money, is advised to explore an easy labyrinth for treasure and material, unaware it's the same labyrinth where Rent. In the labyrinth, Rent reflects on his undead state. He doesn't feel sleep or hunger, which is just as well since he couldn't digest food. He's been fighting non-stop, realizing that evolving into a ghoul will take time. However, his physical abilities and mana use have improved. Surprisingly, he can still use his divinity, a power used to cure injuries and illnesses, purify water, and preserve food, despite being undead. Rent uses his divinity to preserve some bread for three more days, hoping to regain a normal body that can eat by then. Focused on his goal, he cautiously plans his battles, deciding to flee if he faces more than four monsters at once. In this low-level labyrinth, encountering more than five monsters would likely spell doom for him. Rent is hard on himself for still being weak despite 10 years as an adventurer and 20 years of training. He possesses spirit energy, mana, and divinity, a rare combination even among the highest-ranked adventurers. Yet, he wishes for just one powerful ability. Most people in his situation would quit adventuring, but Rent persisted, training daily and learning about monsters and magic from a knowledgeable woman. His ultimate goal is to become a Mithril-class adventurer, a rank held by those who have saved nations. Despite now being a skeleton, Rent's determination remains unshaken. As he defeats more skeletons, Rent begins to feel stronger than when he was human. After easily taking down another slime, he's sure of his growing strength. Collecting slime goo, he experiences a significant change when light emerges from it. Muscles and hair start forming on his body, followed by skin and eyes. Rent evolves into a ghoul, a significant step forward. Though he's just a dried-out corpse, he's relieved to have flesh again. He thinks he might even evolve into a higher-ranking undead, like a vampire, if he keeps working hard. Now with flesh, Rent tries speaking but can only produce a roar. After some practice, he manages to say hello and good morning, though he sounds more like a zombie. Later, Rent, now with flesh, battles goblins in the dungeon. These goblins are dangerous in groups, but Rent cleverly uses the dungeon's layout to isolate a few for easier combat. Rent, now evolved into a ghoul, has gained muscle and become more agile than when he was just bones. Surprisingly, his mana, spirit energy, and divinity have all increased, making him stronger. He's now able to enhance not just himself but also his sword, which he uses to swiftly defeat a group of goblins. During his exploration, Rent hears a fight nearby and discovers it's a blonde girl from the guild. She's battling a weak skeleton. Rent is excited to see another human after such a long time, but he stops himself from approaching her, aware of his ghastly ghoul appearance. He decides to watch her from afar, realizing he's never seen her before and figuring she must be a new adventurer. Rent reflects on his knowledge of the adventurers in town, knowing them well since they often mock weaker members like him. So, understanding their abilities and allies is beneficial. Rent continues to observe the girl, noting her training but also her lack of strength. She carefully times her attacks but fails to be aware of her surroundings. This leads to her being cornered by a skeleton, but she bravely fights back despite being overpowered. Seeing no other option, Rent intervenes to save her. The girl is shocked and terrified at the sight of the ghastly ghoul. Rent wishes she would help him fight the skeleton, but she's too stunned to be of any use. He quickly dispatches the skeleton and checks on her. When he tries to speak, his zombie-like voice scares her further. To demonstrate he's not a threat, Rent throws away his sword. The girl slowly realizes he's trying to communicate and understands that he's Rent the Adventurer. She wonders if his ghoul appearance is some kind of disguise. Rent is at a loss for words to explain his situation to Rena, the girl he just saved. He's technically dead, yet still alive. Rena, realizing he's different from the monsters, thanks him for saving her. Rent reassures her that he's not a threat and asks for her help. She agrees to buy him a rope so he can return to town, and Rent lets her keep the change. Rena introduces herself as the daughter of a knight and promises to help Rent as a way to repay him for saving her. After she leaves, Rent notices her cautious behavior around him. He knows a sensible adventurer would report a mysterious ghoul like him to the guild, but he trusts that Rena, a stranger, won't betray his trust. Back in town, the first thing Rena does is rush to the guild. The guild lady, who was worried about Rena, listens as Rena urgently asks her a question. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, Rent battles another slime and confirms he's much stronger than he was as a human. His body moves precisely as he wants, and he easily destroys another slime. Rent starts to think his improved combat skills come from intuition rather than training or study. Ironically, he only gained this power after becoming an undead. To Rent's surprise, Rena returns to the dungeon. 
He convinces her that he's the same ghoul she met before, explaining that ghouls don't usually appear on the dungeon's early level. Rena notices that Rent's speech has improved, and he shares that he's been practicing. Rena brings Rent clothes, but she's still scared of his ghoul appearance. She apologizes and hopes she'll get used to it. Rent appreciates her choice of a mage-like robe that covers his entire body. Rena also thoughtfully brings him boots, gloves, and bandages, explaining she had to ask around town for shop locations since she's new. The bandages, she suggests, can cover his arms and legs, showing that she's considered everything he might need. Rent feels moved by Rena's kindness, but as a ghoul, he can't even cry since his body lacks the necessary functions. After putting on the clothes Rena brought, Rent looks quite presentable. The outfit is more comfortable than he expected, though it slightly hinders his visibility. However, he assures Rena that everything is perfect, as he can still fight effectively. Rena makes an awkward move by showing Rent his now ghastly face in a mirror. Realizing his appearance could be problematic, she presents him with a mask. The mask seems to attach itself to his face almost urgently. To their dismay, they find it won't come off. Both are alarmed, and Rena admits that the shop where she bought the mask seemed a bit shady. She chose it for its low price of just three copper coins and didn't notice any curses when she touched it. Rent surmises that the mask's curse activates upon being worn. Rena is amazed to see Rent using divinity and wonders if he can break the curse. Rent tries, but his energy depletes quickly, leaving the curse intact. Rent reassures her that the mask reacted to his divinity, so he plans to save money and seek a powerful cleric to remove the curse. He starts to distance himself, remembering his monstrous form, but Rena stops him. She acknowledges that Rent is not a bad person and says she's no longer scared, despite still trembling. Rent tells her there's no need to rush in getting used to him being a ghoul. Rena promises it won't take long for her to adjust, and they head back to town. During their journey, Rena shares that she left the capital from Malt because there were no suitable jobs for rookies like her there. Rent is amazed that Rena traveled to the countryside, but she explains her desire to see the world and quickly become a skilled adventurer. Rent advises that being cautious, like him, is wise for adventurers since everyone has only one life. Rena agrees, and they share a laugh over a joke about Rent being a rare zombie. Upon reaching Malt, Rent notes that many locals know him, so using his ID might raise suspicions due to his changed appearance. They choose to enter through a different gate. Rent thanks Rena, acknowledging he wouldn't have made it without her help. He expresses concern about putting her in a difficult position, as aiding him might be seen as a crime, risking her adventurer's license. Rena, feeling indebted to Rent for saving her life, is willing to take that risk. At the west entrance, the guards question Rent's unusual look. The situation escalates when they demand to see his face. Rena cleverly explains that Rent's mask is cursed and cannot be removed, and his strange voice is due to an injury inflicted by a monster. She presents his disfigured ear as proof, adding that the mask was meant to cover his scars but turned out to be cursed. The guards, sympathetic to Rent's misfortune, allow them to enter after failing to remove the mask. Rena dismisses her actions as mere repayment, but soon after, Rent disappears. He watches Rena search for him, reflecting on her potential as an adventurer. He notes her well-maintained but inexpensive equipment, her decent fighting skills, and her bravery. Rent acknowledges that talented individuals like her usually leave him, so he decides to leave her for now, planning to apologize when he looks more human. Rent's true intention for leaving Rena is revealed when he visits a more suitable human collaborator, someone with a secretive past. He enters a house belonging to Lorraine, his chosen collaborator. Attempting to wake her with his distorted voice, he resorts to threatening to drop a book on her. Lorraine recognizes him despite his covered appearance, but is startled when Rent unexpectedly reveals his ghoulish arm. This bring an end to our episode 1 and 2. Subscribe for more anime recaps. Before Ren got to his friend's house, Lorraine was really tired from working too much while waiting for him. She figured it was pointless to look for the adventure by herself and considered asking the guild for help. Then, she heard a knock at the door and knew right away it was her friend by the way he knocked. Feeling relieved to know he was there, Lorraine decided to get some rest, trusting Ren could let himself in. She was mostly concerned about his safety, not even considering the possibility that he might have turned into something unnatural. But when he showed up and shared his story, Lorraine was taken aback. Despite her knowledge of monsters and magic, she had never heard of someone turning into an undead from being eaten by a dragon. She wondered if the dragon was still in the dungeon. But Ren wasn't sure, he guessed it had left. Lorraine found his story hard to believe, but seeing Ren's condition confirmed it was true. Ren saw that Lorraine stayed calm, which he expected since she was a scholar, mage, and adventurer. Yet, he felt like she saw him more as a research subject than a friend. Lorraine then bluntly asked him if he was sure he was still himself. Ren believed he retained his consciousness, 
and memories, yet he knew he had died and couldn't be certain he was the same person. His response sounded just like something he would say, though Lorraine found it hard to confirm his identity. Nonetheless, she chose to focus on what Ren wanted to do next. Ren said he wanted to keep adventuring and reach the Mithril class, despite his new appearance making it impossible to visit the guild. Lorraine realized he needed her to pick up quests for him. She also knew he couldn't stay at an inn and offered her place for him to stay. Understanding Ren would want to contribute, she suggested he assist with her research in exchange for lodging. After all, studying a monster that had experienced such a unique transformation was a rare opportunity. Rent agreed to help Lorraine with her research, on the condition that he wouldn't be dissected. Lorraine jokingly asked if he thought she was a monster but then hinted she might need just a little bit of his skin and flesh for study. Afterward, Lorraine went out to sell the magic stones and slime liquid Rent had collected in the Lunar Reflection Labyrinth. Thanks to the high-quality materials, she came back with a decent sum of money. Rent then shared that he planned to visit the three-pointed spear to look for a blacksmith. Walking through the streets, his unique appearance caught everyone's attention. At the blacksmith's, he requested a new sword, and the shop attendant noticed his old sword was well used but beyond repair. Observing the damage, she guessed Rent could wield magic or spiritual energy. Rent added that he also had divine energy, surprising the attendant since it was rare for someone to possess all three types of energy. She mentioned he was only the second person they knew of with such ability. Rent asked her to keep this information confidential, and she agreed, stating that maintaining clients' privacy was part of their service. Rent paid a hefty deposit for a high-quality new sword, with the agreement to pay the rest later. The attendant informed him that crafting the sword would take some time, as the blacksmith was meticulous and took pride in his work. He might also want to consult with Rent during the process. Rent assured her that wouldn't be an issue, as the blacksmith could get in touch with Lorraine whenever he needed to discuss the sword further. While at home, Lorraine dove into her studies on ghouls, undead beings known for their strength and ability to live through severe injuries like losing their head. Her research showed that ghouls often crave the flesh of living creatures, especially humans, and are typically found in dark places like labyrinths. Some stories suggest ghouls arise from dead humans, while other tales talk of powerful monsters that can transform humans into mindless undead, stripping away their personality and emotions. However, Rent's situation, where he retained his memories and emotions, was unheard of in her studies, making him a unique case. Lorraine reminisced about her early days at the guild when she was asked to take Rent, then a beginner adventurer, with her into the Blue Forest to help him gain experience. Back then, despite her significant achievement of becoming the youngest Grand Doctor and earning a silver-class adventurer status, life seemed uninteresting to her. She had gone to the nation of Yarlan under the guise of collecting herbs, but in reality, she was just looking for something to do, feeling directionless. During their task, Lorraine aimed to carefully harvest a particular plant, ensuring to get its roots. She asked Rent to bring his backpack for storing the plant, and was surprised to find he had already gathered several plants correctly, roots and all, showing a good understanding of the task despite his inexperience. Their peaceful gathering was interrupted when Rent noticed a goblin aiming at them. He quickly moved to shield Lorraine telling her to use her magic against the goblin. After she successfully defeated the creature, Rent was impressed, thinking that her magic was on another level because she was a silver-class adventurer. Lorraine modestly disagreed, implying there was nothing extraordinary about her magical attack. After the battle, Rent handed Lorraine a cup of water, inquiring if that was her first real fight. Lorraine admitted it wasn't, but she usually had company or guards with her, making her realize that instead of her helping Rent, it was he who had been assisting her. Rent pointed out her apparent lack of experience for someone of her class, which was why people were worried about her venturing into the Blue Forest alone, suggesting his accompaniment as a safety measure. Lorraine noted Rent's extensive knowledge about herbs, and he shared that a seasoned adventurer once told him the importance of education in various fields for adventurers. Realizing she hadn't asked for his name, Rent introduced himself, and Lorraine did the same, asking him to share his knowledge with her, impressed by his understanding of herbs, monsters, and navigation. Their friendship formed quickly, and over the next decade, Rent worked hard towards achieving Mithril class, with Lorraine always by his side, deepening her research. Lorraine acknowledged how she had changed, understanding the concern others had for her and regretting not keeping in touch with them. Returning to the present, Rent thanked the blacksmith, Cloak, for agreeing to craft a new weapon for him. The girl at the shop lent Rent a sword to use in the meantime, which Cloak mentioned could channel magic and spiritual energy, cautioning against using other powers. Despite sensing Rent's troubles, Cloak and the girl chose not to pry, suspecting a curse might be involved. Later, Rent cooked dinner for Lorraine, who was thankful. Although noticing Rent didn't eat, he explained his lack of appetite in his undead state. 
Lorraine shared her findings on Ghouls, highlighting Rent's unique evolution, and pondered his future development. Rent expressed his desire to regain his humanity by defeating monsters and evolving further. Back in the moonlit labyrinth, Rent saved a man from a slime attack but was cautious due to the potential for deception among adventurers. Despite this, the man followed Rent, asking to join him after admitting his newness to adventuring and his dire financial situation, hoping to resolve his debt through adventuring. Rent, though wary, decided to let the man accompany him, reflecting on his own identity and the oddity of suddenly having a companion. Despite the uncertainty, Rent and the new guy, the cook, keep moving together. Rent takes him through a hidden path where he had a dangerous encounter with a dragon, thinking it might still have valuable items that could help the cook pay off his debts. The cook is surprised by the discovery, as his map showed nothing there, just a dead end. As they explore, they come across a small entrance leading to another secret area. The cook wonders aloud if Rent could earn some money by sharing this discovery with the guild, but Rent doesn't respond. Understanding Rent's silence, the cook promises not to claim the discovery as his own, recognizing Rent's lack of interest in recognition. Rent suggests they check out the new passage together. They find themselves in an empty room. The cook starts looking for more hidden spots, hoping to find treasure. Rent notices a strange drawing on the floor and tries to caution him, but it's too late. The cook steps on it and vanishes, teleported away by what Rent realizes must be a magic circle meant to transport them to a more dangerous part of the labyrinth. Rent faces a moral dilemma, leave the cook behind or follow him, potentially into a more perilous situation. Deciding he can't just abandon him, Rent steps onto the circle, instantly teleporting to the cook's location. He finds the cook on the ground, unharmed but shaken. Before they can take a breath, Rent finds himself trapped in a room of the labyrinth with a giant skeleton, realizing the exit has disappeared. Unwilling to give up, he decides to fight, using his divine energy despite warnings against it. To his relief, his sword holds up, and he defeats the giant skeleton with two strikes. After the battle, Rent heals the novice's wounds with his magic, providing limited relief for superficial injury. The novice is surprised and impressed by Rent's prowess, considering the giant skeleton a powerful monster. Rent reveals he obtained a valuable magic stone with the victory and offers it to the novice to settle his debts. However, Rent explains it won't be entirely free. Rent shows the novice a part of his arm, altered after being defeated by a monster. He can't enter guilds or shops, so he needs someone to do it for him. The novice agrees, finding it a straightforward task, but Rent requests free meals at the novice's restaurant in return. The cook agrees, grateful for the help in settling his debts and offers Rent the freedom to eat at his restaurant whenever he wants. With the deal settled, Rent and the novice prepare to leave the labyrinth. Rent realizes the novice can't see the magic teleportation circles indicating the exit. Trusting Rent, the novice follows his guidance, and they both return to Malt. Rent decides to explore the labyrinth another time. Back in Malt, Rent accompanies the novice to his restaurant, the Red Dragon Tavern, as gratitude for the assistance. The adventurer enters a well-presented place, noticing it seems bankrupt, possibly due to the taste of the food. The cook's wife appears, relieved to see her husband safe but becomes worried when she notices his injury. The guy reassures her, explaining the adventurer saved him and healed his injuries. To their surprise, the adventurer also hands over the amount needed to pay their debt in the form of a magic stone. However, the wife is suspicious, thinking it's too good to be true and worrying about potential deception. The guy, named Loris, assures her that the adventurer is genuinely good-hearted and helped him when he learned about the debt. In return, the adventurer will assist with simple tasks, including allowing him to eat for free at the restaurant. The wife is puzzled as it seems like a small favor compared to the help received but Loris emphasizes that it means a lot to them in finally getting rid of the debt. Emotional and grateful, they thank the adventurer for all the help. Loris introduces himself and his wife Isabel, expressing their gratitude as the adventurer, Rent, says his goodbyes. Loras, grateful for being saved, asks to know the name of his savior. Rent, wanting to keep his identity confidential, introduces himself, and Loras promises to call him adventurer to maintain the secrecy. Loras invites Rent to his restaurant anytime, expressing joy in serving him. Rent leaves and heads to Lorraine's house. Along the way, he senses something strange and ponders his current state. Reaching Lorraine's place, he notices his vision acting peculiar. Inside, Lorraine asks about his labyrinth adventure and the letters from the Empire. She senses something is off with Rent but assumes he might be drunk. Rent, however, loses control and attacks Lorraine, biting her shoulder. Concerned, she uses magic to make him unconscious. Upon waking, Rent apologizes, explaining that he met a man in the labyrinth whose taste drove him to madness, leading to the unfortunate incident with Lorraine. 
Lorraine, anticipating the possibility of Rent losing control due to his ghoul nature, uses magic to subdue him. Before leaving him alone, she shows him the wound on her shoulder, explaining that she had just sold her potions to the magic pharmacy. Despite planning to make a healing potion in the morning, Rent decides to use his divine magic to heal her immediately. Lorraine, surprised by the effectiveness of divine magic, feels a pleasant sensation as the pain fades away, leaving only a mark. Rent continues to heal until there's no trace of the injury, astounding Lorraine. Rent notices changes in his appearance, realizing that his mask now covers only his eyes. Experimenting with the mask's responsiveness to desires, he tries to hide his mouth, and the mask obediently covers the lower part of his face. Curious about the mask, Lorraine suggests attempting to remove it. Both Rent and Lorraine try, but the mask remains firmly attached. Lorraine speculates about the mask's nature, comparing it to magic swords with a will of their own. Rent decides to keep the lower part of his face covered, accepting his undead state. Lorraine notices that Rent can now speak more clearly and naturally, and Rent believes he might have undergone existential evolution again, possibly turning into the giant skeleton he defeated. However, he questions the timing, as the evolution into a ghoul happened immediately. Lorraine suggests that it might have occurred when he fed on her blood, changing him from a ghoul into a ghast, a weaker servant of vampires. Rent wonders why he turned into a ghast, and Lorraine explains that existential evolution is a mystery even for scholars. She then shares her theory about evolution and asks if Rent wants to know more. Rent agrees, and Lorraine explains that existential evolution happens when a monster transforms into a more powerful being. She mentions Rent's initial form as a skeleton and subsequent evolution into a ghoul. Lorraine hypothesizes that Rent's evolution is driven by his desire to appear as close to human as possible. Rent finds the theory sensible but questions why he didn't evolve into a vampire, which is more human-like than a ghast. Lorraine clarifies that evolution might follow a sequential path, much like the stages of gaining power in the Adventurer's Guild. She compares it to experiments with smaller monsters that evolve based on their environment, adapting to factors like fire or water. Lorraine suggests that Rent's evolution might be a passive response to his environment while still being influenced by his own will. Rent contemplates the possibility of evolving into a vampire and eventually returning to his human state. However, Lorraine is skeptical, thinking that only the first option might be feasible, and she's uncertain if he can fully revert to his original form. She believes that future existential evolutions might involve more than defeating monster especially considering his transformation into a ghast after ingesting her blood. Lorraine promises to support Rent on his long journey and offers to conduct experiments on him to gather data about his new form. She plans to use magic to document his body, perform various tests on a piece of his skin, and examine changes in his sleep and appetite. While Rent is initially hesitant about the idea of undergoing so many experiments, Lorraine decides to postpone them to the next day. The following day, Rent wakes up early to train realizing that the strange impulses from the previous day have disappeared, and he feels back to normal. However, he notices that his sword, used against the giant skeleton, is severely worn out. Unable to take the damaged weapon into the labyrinth, Rent visits the blacksmith Cloak's shop to explain the situation. Cloak is displeased with the state of the sword but offers to provide another, slightly better and more resilient, as Rent is one of his valued customers. Rent accepts the new weapon and sets out to continue exploring the labyrinth with the goal of achieving a new existential evolution. Along the way, he encounters Loras and Isabel, who are buying various foods for their work at the Red Dragon Tavern. Lorraine tells Rent that he will be surprised to see harmful substances for humans rolling towards that direction. She starts activating the spell, mentioning that alone, it can cause diarrhea and numbness in the limbs. But if combined with purification and distillation, they can even defeat the Red Bear. Rento thinks to himself that alchemy is indeed scary, and though he agreed to help her with experiments, he fears he might die assisting her. Later, he drinks the poisonous potion and she asks if he can use magic to neutralize its effects. He assures her but complains about the terrible taste. She reveals that he is the first person to taste the poison and, despite not affecting him, his body responds to the antidote. She admires his unique body and asks if his desire for sleep has disappeared after the transformation. He confirms, stating he no longer feels the need to sleep. She expresses jealousy and calls him weak, but he admits still craving human flesh and blood. Stritch Lorna hands him a bottle, revealing it contains her blood with a charm to preserve it. Despite his initial resistance to the idea of drinking human blood, she persuades him to consume it regularly to avoid losing control. Brento reluctantly tastes it and finds it delicious. She asks if a drop is enough, and he agrees, satisfied with quenching his thirst. He informs her of his departure to the labyrinth, 
and she reminds him to show his personal card at the guild to receive a mission, warning of potential trouble due to his appearance. Brent is surprised by this information and says that while his appearance has changed significantly, he's just a bronze-ranked adventurer, and he doubts anyone will pay attention to him. However, Lorraine explains that there are many adventurers with a bronze rank like him, but the guild has a special appreciation for him due to his dedication, such as assisting newcomers and handling troublesome tasks. He considers those tasks simple, but she emphasizes their value and mentions there was even a discussion about appointing him as a guild member. This revelation astonishes Rent, and he wonders why they would consider someone like him. Lorraine explains that they found it difficult to discuss it with him directly because he never expressed a desire to retire. Rent then asks how she knows all this, and she mentions having some connections within the guild. Rent firmly states that he has no intention of retiring or joining the guild. Lorraine continues, revealing that to raise his rank, he must take an exam which ordinary adventurers can only attempt if they have notable achievement. She suggests that he takes the test himself, and he contemplates the situation. Lorraine figures out a solution for him to take the test. He should become someone else. The next day, Rent is at the guild expressing his nostalgia for the place. He encounters Sheila, the staff member, who asks if it's his first time there. Rent informs her that he wants to register as an adventurer. Sheila hands him a form explaining that he can leave any unanswered questions blank except for his name. Rent reflects on how 10 years ago he only knew his name and age. But now the situation is different. He contemplates that his goal remains the same, and he fills out the form with his updated skills and magical abilities. Afterwards, he remembers Lorraine's words, suggesting he re-register with a new name. He initially dismisses the idea, as registering with two names would violate the rules. Lorraine, however, insists there is no other way. Besides, even if they discover it, it won't be a serious offense, as he can explain his transformation. Whereas being known as the person who willingly transformed might raise more questions. Rent completes the registration form under the new name and hands it to Sheila, the staff member. Sheila is surprised to see that his name, Rent is quite similar to his previous one. Rent wonders if she is concerned about him and she explains that a few days ago, they lost an adventurer named Rent as well. Rent is astonished and asks if she means Rent Vanna. Sheila is surprised he knows him and reveals that Lorna informed her. Sheila then mentions that Rent Vivi's family name is the same as Lorna's, and she asks if he is related to Lady Lorna. Rent confirms it, mentioning he is currently staying with her. Sheila acknowledges hearing about it and notes that the news is already spreading. She thought Rent Vivi might be the same as Rent Vina since they share a similar name. Rent realizes it was a wise decision not to tell her about his relation to Lorna, wanting to avoid rumors. He also acknowledges that the name Rent is quite common, and adventurers with unique appearances are not uncommon. Sheila asks him to wait while she finishes the paperwork. Rent reflects on the decision to inform her of being Lorna's relative. He doesn't want unnecessary rumors circulating about her. Sheila returns, hands him his card, and reminds him that the most important thing is his life. Rent thanks her and takes the card, officially becoming an iron-ranked adventurer, and then leaves the guild. After that, Rent finds himself in the labyrinth and is surprised by a strange sound. He discovers a group of children fighting a small imp. Rent realizes that they are novice adventurers, likely undergoing spiritual training despite their young age. He observes their good cooperation and decides they will be fine. He leaves them and thinks to himself that he used to guide newcomers in the past, but with his current appearance, he might only scare them. Rent quickly heads to another location in the main, acknowledging that valuable information about mazes can be exchanged for money. He plans to explore a new area and report back to increase his achievements as he stands in a new and peculiar place, surrounded by numerous books and items. He notices a skeletal structure lying on a bed. He wonders if people once lived in this part of the maze. Suddenly, he hears a girl's voice asking him what he's doing there. Rent hesitates to respond. The girl repeats her question, asking what he's up to. Rent stammers, explaining that he was just searching the area to see if there was anything valuable. He emphasizes that he's an adventurer. The intimidating girl assumes he's a thief, asserting her boundary and warning him that he'll die in this place if he crosses them. She then uses a powerful spell to strike him with a fiery sphere, causing him to fall and sustain a serious injury. Rent tries to stand up, but the girl is astonished by his strange body. She accuses him of being the cause of his peculiar form. But Rent protests, stating that he didn't choose this body. The girl, still skeptical, is taken aback by his appearance. Rent reassures her that he means no harm and he is not responsible for his current state. At that moment, the girl lowers her hand from the attack and apologizes for the misunderstanding. She approaches Rent, expressing regret for almost killing him and acknowledges the misconception. She then removes her cloak, 
telling him that she's unsure if it will compensate him but gives it to him, stating they will be equals. The girl informs him that the place is crucial for her and asks him to keep it a secret. She assures him that no one can enter without him, but she acknowledges that adventurers should not return empty-handed. To maintain a balance, she gives him the magical map of Acacia, an enchanted tool that automatically records the rooms he passes in the labyrinth. So the girl then uses her magic to transport him to another location in the maze. After finding his way back home, Lorna notices the map and questions if he is cursed or encountering strange things. Rent reassures her, explaining that he did not choose this path but is dealing with unexpected events. He shows her the magical map, and when he attempts to use his magic on it, it doesn't respond. Lorna understands, and Rent realizes that the tool is safe to use. The tree decides to test it by casting a spell on the map. Surprisingly, the map reacts, displaying the reflected moon labyrinth, the same maze he was in a moment ago. Rento concludes that the magical map is secure and can be used without any curses or issues. Lorna is astonished by the magical map, and suddenly she notices two marks pointing to the locations of two people. The names Rise and Laura appear on the map indicating the presence of these adventurers. Rento informs Lorna that he encountered them recently in the labyrinth. Lorna is surprised that the map displays the names and locations of people in the maze, considering it a frightening ability. She requests Rento to reveal the map of other mazes. Rento tries to display the crescent maze, but the map only shows areas he has explored before. He recalls the girl's explanation that the map automatically records the regions the owner traverses. Lorna examines Rento's cloak, and he asks her to check if it is cursed. She assures him that it seems fine and is likely resistant to magic. Later, Lorna expresses her belief that the cloak has high protective ability. Rento is relieved and happy with the benefits of the deal. However, Lorna rhetorics his attention, questioning the identity of the girl who almost killed him. Yesicles, Rento admits he knows nothing about her, only that she possessed immense strength. Lorna suggests there might be a technique allowing someone to create a living space within the maze. Despite Lorna's warning, Rento decides to visit the girl again. Lorna advises against it, but Rento is determined to have another conversation with her. As he walks through the maze, he encounters a skeletal structure, recalling Lorna's words about the cursed. The memory of the day he discovered the secret area in the maze and encountered the dragon, leading to his transformation into an immortal monster, crosses his mind. After being trapped in the cursed mask, Rento believes people consider him unlucky, but he disagrees. He sees his increasing strength as he faces powerful monsters and solves more puzzles. Despite the rumors of being jinxed, he feels a sense of adventure comparable to someone in the Mithril Ray. As Rento wanders inside the demise, he realizes that the entrance he used to have is no longer there. Perplexed, he checks his map, but it seems unresponsive, making him suspect that it no longer wants him to come. The scene shifts to the Adventurer's Guild, where a receptionist discusses Rento's positive efforts with another adventurer. The adventurer inquires about Rento, and the receptionist mentions that he might be on a guard mission or something similar concerned for Rento's well-being. The adventurer asks the receptionist to inform him if she hears any news. He tries the receptionist recalls when Rento expressed his willingness to do anything to attain the mithril rank. However, she is startled when Rento appears behind her. He apologizes and asks her to assign him a mission. The receptionist, worried about the difficulty, hands him a task to collect the flesh of three ghasts, powerful monsters. Rento insists that he can handle it, having fought them before. Despite her concerns, the receptionist advises him against taking such a challenging mission at his current iron rank. Rento, confident in his abilities, assures her that he can accomplish the task. The receptionist agrees, emphasizing that he should not push himself to the point of impossibility and escape if he finds himself in a dire situation. Rento acknowledges the value of his life and promises to preserve it. After finishing his first job as new Rant, Rant reflects on how important a magic bag is for a lone adventurer like himself. Saving up for it took him five years, but he believes it was worth it. He has successfully prepared and preserved the orc meat, feeling confident that the client will be satisfied. With the task done, news spreads quickly about how efficiently New Rant defeated three orcs single-handedly. People are curious about this newcomer, making Rant realize he stands out as a rookie iron-class adventurer. When Shayla returns, Rant is surprised to learn that her manager has suggested he take the promotion exam. Getting such an opportunity shortly after registering is uncommon, but they see potential in new Rant. Accepting the offer means Rant will become a bronze-class adventurer if he passes. Lorraine is pleased to hear the good news, but Rant attributes it to his new body. However, Lorraine reminds him not to underestimate himself, as he is the one controlling that body. 
Lorraine feels disappointed when she finds out that he chose the name Rent Vivier for himself because it's her family name and it might make people suspicious. Rent explains that if a strange man hangs out in her house, it could start rumors, so it's better if he pretends to be her relative. Lorraine understands this but also assures him not to worry about her reputation. She describes herself as a struggling scholar who moved to this town because she couldn't succeed in the capital. She doesn't care what others think of her, but Rent doesn't want to cause her any trouble. Lorraine acknowledges that Rent does all the cooking, washing, and cleaning, so she feels she owes him more than he owes her. Rent disagrees, saying he's only still human because of her. These words move Lorraine, and she offers Rent to stay with her for as long as he wants. Since they're like family, Rent accepts her offer. The next day, Rent goes to the guild for his exam. Shayla is surprised because she thought he would wait for the next one to have more time to study. The next exam isn't until several months later, and he doesn't want to wait that long. An adventurer arrives late after watching Anakit's videos, and Rent thinks this tardiness will cost him points. Being late shows unreliability, which might lead to failing the exam. The first part of the exam tests knowledge. They'll be quizzed on guild rules and handling monster drops. Only those who pass move on to the practical part. The practical test varies each time. Rent recalls it involved gathering herbs last time. The written test begins, and Rent sees Laura, a girl he knows from the labyrinth. Since her friend isn't there, Rent guesses he's doing the verbal part. It's rare for people to read and write, so Rent feels fortunate he learned in his village. He's confident since he studied everything. Later, any cap fan finds the test hard, but Rent gets a perfect score, which is rare. Rent is relieved to pass, wondering what the practical part will be. Shayla says he'll form a party and do a guild job. He's paired with Rise and Laura. Rise explains he's a swordsman who uses spirit energy to boost his strength. Laura is a mage who can heal with magic. They're told their job is in the labyrinth of the new moon. Their task is to reach a specific point marked on their map. Each team has the same map and must get there by sunset. The first team to arrive gets a reward, turning it into a race. Rise boasts about his past trips to the labyrinth, but Laura reveals they only went partway. Rent surprises them by halting their entry and suggests buying a map. They argue they were given a map by the guild, but Rent points out it's 15 years old and unreliable. The others are shocked the guild tried to deceive them, but Rent isn't fooled. He decides to buy a map, despite their lack of funds. Rem suggests they only need the first floor map. The merchant, impressed by Rent's knowledge, sells it to him for 5 bronze coins. This new map provides more details, including trap locations. The merchant trusts Rent's judgment and advises the group to follow his lead. Laura questions why the guild gave them old maps, and Rem suggests the carriages might have taken them to the wrong place. An adventurer must always be cautious, and the exam tests if they have what it takes. Upon entering the labyrinth, they face skeletons. Ren warns against underestimating them due to their low level. The group showcases their skills by defeating several skeletons easily, impressing Ren. Each member has a specific role, so they work well together without overburdening each other. Rent assists Rise in the battle, and soon it's over. They notice an unusual number of monsters, leading Rent to suspect a trap. He discovers incense attracting them and warns of an ambush ahead. Laura is surprised when Rent reveals the creatures aren't monsters but intelligent beings. Rise is shocked at the prospect of fighting humans. Rent takes charge, blocking the first attack. Though Rise wants to fight, Rent lets him handle the first opponent and impresses Rise with his agility. Rent easily defeats the archer and prevents the mage from acting. Laura assists Rise with blinding light, helping him gain the advantage. Rent realizes they don't need his help when the group demonstrates excellent teamwork, defeating their opponent. Rise notes that these adversaries were also taking the exam and tried to sabotage them. The examiner allowed any means to win, and Rent warns of future threats beyond monsters. An adventurer must always stay alert. Surprisingly, Rise agrees to follow Rent's lead from now on. As they leave, Rent calls out a hidden person to clean up. The person is shocked Rent knew he was there. He explains the masked person seemed to know they were from the guild, sparking curiosity about his identity. The hidden person suspects he knows who the masked figure is, considering his sister's warnings. At the guild, Shayla meets the guildmaster, who's interested in rumors about Rent Vivier. Some say he's a criminal due to his sudden appearance and skills. Although his past is unknown, the guildmaster acknowledges every adventurer has a history. They can't ignore the accusations, so he asks Shayla to keep him informed about Rent's background. In the labyrinth, our group is near the destination. Ahead lies one of several boss rooms on this floor, the only way to reach the destination. The young adventurers have never faced a boss before, something two iron-class adventurers can't handle. Rise feels offended when Rent questions if he's scared, but Rent explains it's okay to avoid a fight you can't win. Some other examinees show up, and Laura is surprised when Rent says it's perfect timing. This new group insults our heroes, calling them weirdos. Rent doesn't like being talked to like that. When they target Laura, Rise defends her. The guys keep pushing, so Rent warns them. 
They try to brush it off as a joke, but Rent doesn't find it funny. The leader suggests they go first, and Rent agrees, wanting his team to rest. The guys enter the room, boasting about going first. Rise worries it means they'll lose, but Laura trusts Rent's decision. Rise thinks Rent wants them to watch a boss fight first, but there's more to it. Suddenly, they hear screams from the first group, who are carried out. Rent explains that guild employees rescued them, so even if they lose, they won't die. He wanted them to see this to reassure them, emphasizing it's okay to avoid a fight they can't win. Rise worries that if he runs away now, he might never return. This would mean he'd never become a real adventurer, so he asks Laura to fight with him. Laura agrees, and Rent sees Rise has made his decision. An adventurer who's been broken once becomes weak. While it's common for adventurers to quit when things get tough, Rise senses this and decides not to run. This is an important part of becoming an adventurer, so they all enter the boss room together. Raze asks Ren to teach them how to fight the monster boss. Ren says it's just one part of the whole test. They spot people escaping and Ren reassures them that it's okay to retreat rather than face certain defeat. Raze insists that fleeing means giving up on their dreams of becoming true adventurers. Laura is surprised, but Ren urges them to decide. The three heroes enter a gate and encounter a huge slime. Reese and Laura prepare to fight but Ren says it's not necessary to defeat the leader. He hopes others will handle it, but facing challenges is crucial. Raze fights the slime while Laura focuses on enhancing her magic, as Ren suggests. He emphasizes that magic is necessary against the slime, not physical attacks. Laura confirms her ability to wield potent fire magic, but it takes time to activate. Ren promises to shield her from the slime's attacks while she prepares the spell. Raze asks if he can help with the attack. And then we snap back to the present as Rizzy continues to assail the large slime. Laura requests Ren's aid for Rise, assuring him she can handle the situation alone. Ren joins Rise in assaulting the slime while Laura completes her spell, unleashing a powerful blaze that vanquishes the creature. Ultimately, they succeed in defeating the monster leader. Ren informs them of the various benefits of slime fluids, suggesting they gather some and split the earnings among themselves, ensuring each receives at least a share of silver. As they collect the slime fluid, Three individuals suddenly emerge, releasing a sleeping gas. Ren explains how people often drop their guard near the end, falling into traps like this. Laura reminds them that reaching the goal first doesn't guarantee success in the exam, citing the guildmaster's instructions to reach the designated point on the map. She recalls the guildmaster's emphasis on rewarding teams based on their efforts, not just their speed. Returning to reality, Laura points out how their mindset turned the exam into a race, explaining why Ren didn't protest when the other team passed them, despite being ahead near the monster leader's chamber. Ren elaborates that an adventurer's main duty is to complete their given task within the set time frame, emphasizing the importance of personal initiative in becoming a true adventurer. They enter the room, where a man congratulates them on being the first to arrive. Laura requests proof of his affiliation with the guild, and he provides it. After rummaging in his bag, he hands them three necklaces or tokens, instructing them to present them at the guild's reception desk to attain bronze rank. He admires the tokens and inquires about the additional reward they mentioned. The official explains that the top three teams will receive a modest reward, then distributes potions and a bag to each of them. Raze expresses his joy at receiving one of the bags and suggests an idea, taking a short trip before returning to the guild. The scene transitions as they descend to the second floor, unsure due to the complexity of mazes, akin to the labyrinthine tunnels of Gaza. As the scene transitions to their arrival, everyone marvels at the sight of the sun. Laura shares that each floor in this place holds unique wonders, leaving them all in awe of the vast beauty surrounding them. While expressing a desire to explore further, Ren advises against it, reminding them that the exam isn't complete until they return safely. The scene shifts to their arrival at the designated place, a location untouched for a long time, filled with perilous traps along the way. Ren stresses the importance of caution in this deceptive guild, warning against being misled. They receive three tokens from the attendant, signaling the end of the bronze rank exam. Curious about what this entails, Ray's questions the attendant, who hesitates before a boy hands her a report to share. Ren explains that the boy had been observing them throughout the exam, assessing their ability and character. The boy confirms their success, reassuring them. With a gentle smile, the guild attendant congratulates them on becoming bronze rank adventurers. Ray's and Laura rejoice, feeling true happiness in their newfound adventurer status. Ren expresses gratitude for their company, but Ray's insists they owe him thanks instead. They credit him for their growth and express a desire to continue adventuring together. Laura acknowledges the impossibility, but expresses a wish for more adventures with him. As they depart, the guild attendant compliments Ren, likening him to a paternal figure. 
She then hesitantly asks him a favor, trusting his intelligence to understand her unspoken inquiry. Ren ponders aloud, suspecting she knows his true identity. When she questions the guild's potential punishment for his past actions, Ren decides to preemptively withdraw from the guild, refusing to face any consequences. He moves to depart, but Sheila grabs hold of his clothes, insisting on learning the truth about his situation. She leads Ren to an empty house for a private conversation. Ren admits to considering escape but was moved by Sheila's genuine concern. He confides in her about his current predicament and his desire to keep the guild uninvolved. Sheila reassures him of her discretion, explaining she hadn't informed the guild due to uncertainty. She only shared some details with her brother, who was observing Ren during the exam, trusting him to keep the secret. She urges Ren to confide in her, but he remains silent. Acknowledging his difficulty in trusting her, she presents a magical contract as a gesture of assurance. Sheila explains that breaching the contract would result in a magical punishment, compelling her to leave the guild and become enslaved in a country where such practices are legal, transferring ownership to another. Ren hesitates, finding Sheila's proposal too drastic. He questions her motives for going to such lengths, and she explains her desire to aid him out of personal gratitude rather than guild obligation. Eventually, Ren agrees to sign the contract, committing to disclose his troubles to her. With a solemn resolve, Ren signs the contract and seeks guidance on where to begin. Deciding to reveal his condition, he unveils his terrifying appearance, shocking Sheila. Despite her initial shock, Sheila reassures Ren of her unwavering support, emphasizing her preference for understanding his suffering. Ren expresses his inner torment to Sheila, prompting her deep sadness. Sensing her hesitation, Ren urges her to reconsider before divulging further. Ren seeks assurance of Sheila's assistance, clarifying his unwillingness to cause harm despite his monstrous transformation. Despite his intent to depart, Sheila stops him, professing her belief in him and promising steadfast support. As the scene transitions to Lauren's house, Sheila's unexpected visit surprises Laura. Apologizing for the late hour, Sheila explains her insistence on speaking with her. Lauren remarks on Sheila's rarity as a visitor, addressing Ren with a request not to jest about his situation. Sheila denies any frivolity, asserting her genuine understanding of Ren's plight. Lauren welcomes them inside, expressing concern over the cleanliness of the place. Ren reassures her of having tidied up before departing. Upon entering, Lauren broaches the topic, asking Sheila how much she knows. Sheila recounts Ren's disclosure of his monstrous nature, but reassures of his non-aggressive stance. Lauren expresses surprise at Sheila's visit despite knowing everything, accusing her of naivety. Sheila asks for clarification prompting Lauren to highlight the oddity of a scholarly individual inviting a witch and a monster into her home. Lauren jests about the typical fate of witches in such situations, prompting laughter from Sheila, who refutes the accusation, highlighting Lauren's renowned intellect instead. In truth, her nightly escapades involve seeking out young virgin blood, which she believes enhances her complexion. The guild employee doubts her story, prompting Lauren to reveal Ren's current condition. Shocked and saddened, the guild employee acknowledges her awareness of the situation. Lauren reassures the employee of her good intentions and declines a dinner invitation, stating it's too late. Renato then prepares a meal, which they both enjoy immensely. Impressed by Renato's cooking skills, the guild employee expresses gratitude, acknowledging his reputation as a talented chef. Renato attributes his culinary prowess to his upbringing in the village. Lauren appreciates Renato's contributions to household chores, hinting at the blood-filled bottle as his unique form of payment. Renato, confirming their magical contract, admits he hasn't disclosed his true nature to anyone. Recognizing Renato as a chatey, a low-level vampire, the guild employee remains calm. Discussing recent events, the guild employee notes the increase in missing novice adventurers across the kingdom. Lauren inquires about their fate, but the guild employee suspects kidnapping due to the absence of their belongings. This revelation deepens their concern for the safety of adventurers. Lauren recognizes the suspicion surrounding Renato, noting his exceptional talents and uncharacteristic behavior for a novice. The guild employee acknowledges that jealousy has fueled rumors about him, complicating his situation. Renato suggests refraining from visiting the maze for a few days to alleviate tensions. When asked for clarification, he suggests a hiatus of three or four days. Meanwhile, at the Adventurer's Guild, Reyes and Lara express their desire for a skilled companion like Renato to join their team. Reyes plans to revisit the second floor once they assemble a team, while Lara anticipates battling numerous monsters. The Guild Master encourages all beginners to strive for higher ranks. Upon hearing of Renato's success in the exam, the Guild Master expresses curiosity about his fate. Initially intending to recruit Renato after his retirement, the Guild Master is interrupted by news of a troubled newcomer. 
prompting the guild employee to investigate. As she departs, she addresses him as guild leader. This brings an end to our episode. See you with the new episode next week. Until then subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. A few days later, Rent leaves home while Lorraine is still asleep. However, she wakes up when she hears the door and wonders why he didn't stay to rest, considering he can't go to the labyrinth until the suspicion of kidnapping disappears. Rent heads to the blacksmith, Cloak, to pick up his order, which is now ready. He tests his new sword, and Cloak explains that he adjusted it to be easy for Rent to use, knowing his preferences as an adventurer. The sword is designed to withstand mana, as well as spiritual and divine energy. Rent tests each energy type on wooden logs. He starts with mana, delivering a powerful blow that impresses Cloak, who acknowledges Rent's improved skills. Rent then demonstrates his control over spiritual energy, followed by testing divine energy, leaving Cloak astonished by the powerful cuts in the logs. Cloak notices some sprouts on the logs, speculating that they're an effect of divine energy. He asks Rent about acquiring such power, usually associated with a divine attribute. Rent explains finding an abandoned shrine in the past but never attending it for religious reasons as he doesn't even know which deity it belonged to. Cloak asks to keep the sprouts, thinking they might generate divine energy. Rent agrees and asks to conduct more tests with his new weapon. Cloak provides another wooden log and asks if Rent is familiar with the technique of merging mana and energy. Rent mentions hearing rumors, and Cloak explains it's a master's technique of activating both simultaneously, significantly increasing the attack's impact. However, he warns of the risk of the person exploding while attempting this fusion. Despite knowing the dangers, Rent decides to proceed with the fusion, reasoning that even if his body explodes, he probably won't lose his life with his current body. Seeing Rent's determination, Cloak gives him a cheaper sword for the test, ensuring the safety of his new weapon. Rent charges Mana into the sword and channels spiritual energy into his other hand. He feels immense power but struggles to control it. With great effort, he unleashes a strike that completely destroys the wooden log, impressing Cloak and making him wonder about the potential if Rent combined it with divine energy. Next, Rent decides to fuse all three elements, believing he needs considerable power to advance as an adventurer. The resulting power is so intense that it causes the sword to crack. Rent quickly launches his attack before the weapon disintegrates, transforming the log into a ball. After completing the tests, Rent apologizes to the blacksmith for damaging the sword. Cloak reassures him, explaining that divine energy removes impurities and restores matter, making it unsuitable for use with a normal weapon. He hands over the ordered sword, warning that while he crafted it to withstand divine energy, it couldn't handle the fusion of all three elements, supporting at most mana along with energy. At that moment, Rent remembers meeting the mage and asks Cloak what he should do if he faces an opponent he can't beat. The blacksmith suggests buying more weapons, but Rent explains he doesn't have enough money for that. So, Rent leaves with just one sword, deciding to combine mana and energy, determined to earn more money to buy better gear and become a mithril-class adventurer. On his way home, Rent sees an adventurer arguing with a boy who wants to pay for a service not approved by the guild, which seems suspicious. Needing money, Rent steps in and offers to take over the job. The man gives Rent the payment from the boy and walks away. Rent tells the boy, Roomti, that he doesn't promise to accept the task but is willing to listen. Rundis explains that he needs someone to kill the lake master. So, Rundis explains to Rent and Lorraine that he's from the village of Tatsu, which is a few days' journey from Malt. He tells them about the village annual festival, where they follow an old tradition by offering a beautiful maiden as a sacrifice to the lake master to save the village. Rundis goes on to say that the real lake master has appeared recently, eating the sacrificed maiden and now demanding more sacrifices, including his sister. Rent agrees to take on the job not just to kill a monster but to save Rundis' sister. They set off in a cart, and along the way, they notice the eerie silence of Tatsu. Rundis explains that the village used to be livelier before the lake master showed up. When they arrive at Rundis' house, Rent notices a mark on the door, indicating that their family is next to offer a sacrifice. Rundis believes the marks are left by the lake master's servant, a Kelpi. Rent remarks on the strength of Kelpies, and just then, Rundis' sister, Amaris, opens the door. Rundis excitedly introduces Rent, as the person who's going to help, but Amaris remains serious and pulls him inside for a private conversation. Amaris warns her brother not to trust strangers from the city and says that the adventurer seems suspicious and might be lying to them. They argue, and Rent overhears everything with his heightened monster hearing. Later, Amaris thanks Rent but insists that Tatsu's festival is an ancient tradition that can't be changed, and he should leave and pretend nothing happened. However, Rent refuses, explaining that since he accepted the job from Rumti, only he can cancel it. Rundis is relieved and confirms that he won't cancel the job. 
Seeing there's little they can do, Amaris allows Rent to stay in their house but asks him not to disrupt the festival taking place the next day, as she is willing to be sacrificed. Rent spends the night at their house, explaining to Rundis that trying to rescue Amaris wouldn't be helpful based on what he observed. However, Rundis insists that he'll do anything to save his sister, even if it's dangerous. The next morning, Rent goes to the lake's edge to explore the area before the festival starts at night. He sees a merchant offering fruit to some children in exchange for them telling their parents about it, as he hasn't sold anything in a while. Rent tries to ask the children a question, but they get scared by his appearance and run away. Realizing Rent is not from the village, the merchant guesses he's there for the festival and advises him to leave because it's not safe for visitors, especially since the lake's master is in a bad mood, which explains why nobody is interested in buying anything. Just then, Rundis calls Rent for lunch, and Rent says goodbye to the merchant, who once again suggests that he leaves. Rent finds this suspicious and asks Rundis if he knows the merchant. Rundis confirms and explains that the merchant is well known in the village and helps the residents. Later, preparations for the festival begin, and the village women express sympathy for Amaris, who has been chosen for sacrifice. One of them mentions how Rundis has been trying to convince the villagers to end the festival, showing his desperation to save not only Amaris, but all the girls who will also be sacrificed. Amaris cries upon hearing this and then finishes getting ready alone. Rent seizes the chance to speak with Amaris. When she notices him, Amaris tells Rent not to come closer because the sacrifice should avoid contact with others without a reason, and Rent respects her wish. He talks to Amaris from afar and assures her that he and Rundis will find a solution, urging her to resist as much as possible. Amaris believes it's impossible to defeat the Lake Master, but Rent persists, asking her not to do anything to make her brothers sad since they only have each other. With Rent's encouragement, Amaris decides to fight for her life just as the festival is about to start. The villagers prepare to send Amaris, and a treasure as an offering to the lake where the master resides, apologizing to her and saying it's for the village's benefit. Amaris acts as if she accepts her fate, but Rent and Rundis accompany her to the lake. After a while in the water, a fog mysteriously appears, obscuring their vision. Then, a globe included with the offering starts glowing, and they spot a light in the distance, realizing that the lake master has arrived. Suddenly, a massive kraken appears, and Amaris starts pleading with it to protect the village in return for her sacrifice. Rent finds a way to intervene and tosses his glowing globe into the lake, pretending it's just a simple lantern. Then, using a magical item given by the alchemist Lorraine, Rent jumps into the water and walks on its surface. Armed with his sword, Rent is determined to expose the master's true identity. As the monster launches a fire attack, Rent notices something odd. Krakens, being sea creatures, don't have fire abilities. Confident it's an illusion, he approaches the monster, confirming his suspicion. Rent spots a ship nearby and sees the wizard who created the illusion and launched the fire attack, along with the merchant he met earlier. The merchant warns Rent that if he had listened and left, he would have been spared. They all attack Rent, but he stands his ground bravely. When Rent's siblings break through the fog, they find him near a wrecked ship. After rescuing Amaris, they return to the village and reveal the truth about the supposed Lake Master. The villagers are shocked to learn the whole thing was a hoax. Amaris realizes that Rent suspected the truth all along. She explains that monsters revered as masters don't suddenly rebel without reason. Then, one of the villagers interrogates the merchant about the other girls who were sacrificed. Faced with Rent's intimidating presence, the man admits they're alive and being held in a cabin across the lake, with plans to sell them elsewhere for profit. The villagers immediately organize a rescue mission, and Rent confirms with Rundis if he considers the job done, which he does. Rent then prepares to leave for Malt, declining to join the villagers in redoing the festival. He explains to the siblings that he can't stay longer because someone is waiting for him. Rundis and Amaris feel sad about Rent's departure. Rundis expresses gratitude, saying he'll never forget how Rent saved his sister and the entire village. As a gesture of gratitude, the girl decides to kiss Rent on the cheek. After saying goodbye, Rent departs in a carriage, pondering that the merchant and other kidnappers mentioned they only targeted women, suggesting they may not be involved in the disappearance of the novice adventurer Sheila mentioned. Upon returning home, Rent informs Lorraine that he completed his mission, saving Rundis's sister's life and all the other girls offered as sacrifices. He expresses gratitude for the magical item she lent him, which helped him walk on water. Lorraine mentions she would have liked to meet the lake master if he existed but Rent thinks it's good she stayed behind for another task. Later, Lorraine suggests that Rent may have won the saved girl's heart, reminding him of her gratitude. However, Rent believes adventurers are often forgotten, expecting the girl to eventually move on from him as well. Rent enters the guild and checks the requests on the board. 
Although the rewards aren't enticing, he knows adventurers aren't just in it for the money. They help people whose requests might not get accepted by the guild. Sheila asks if Rent is interested in any requests, but he declines, sticking to his promise of avoiding labyrinths for a while. Sheila tries to find an easy request for Rent, and he asks if anyone has taken the bronze coin request. Sheila informs him that it's challenging, involving gathering dragon blood blossoms near a poisonous swamp. Legend has it that these blossoms originated from a dragon's blood, who fell in love with a human girl. Rent isn't fond of the legend, but Sheila mentions rumors that whoever presents the flower to a girl will earn eternal love. Rent wonders if the plant has medicinal property, and Sheila explains that the client needs it for medicine, as the orphanage children put up the request to save someone important to them. Rent surprises Sheila by deciding to take up the request, showing his willingness to help despite any expectation. Arriving at the orphanage, he's taken aback by its dilapidated condition, not expecting it to be so run down. When he attempts to use the door knocker, it comes loose from the door, prompting him to use slime fluid to reattach it. Instead of risking the knocker again, he opts to knock with his knuckles. A young girl answers the door, mistaking Rent for a debt collector due to his unexpected arrival. She explains that their chairman, Lillian, is currently absent, suggesting Rent return another day. However, before she can finish her sentence, she realizes Rent's identity as an adventurer there to fulfill their guild request. Apologizing for the confusion, the girl welcomes Rent inside the orphanage. Upon entering, the children are curious about Rent's presence, prompting the girl to introduce him as an adventurer. They eagerly approach him with questions, but the girl reminds them to exercise caution around adventurers, as some can pose a danger. Acknowledging her concern, Rent assures the girl that not all adventurers are risky, but it's wise to be cautious. He advises the children to be wary of suspicious individuals. Impressed by their honesty, Rent appreciates their trust and emphasizes the importance of their safety. Pleased with their sincerity, Rent is touched by their happiness despite their circumstances. The girl speaks highly of Lillian, portraying her as a caring and kind caretaker to them. Rent reassures Elise that she doesn't need to be overly polite with him, assuring her that he won't take offense. Elise expresses concern that Rent might become angry with her later, but he promises that won't happen. Introducing himself as a bronze-ranked adventurer, Rent surprises Elise, who expected only an iron-ranked adventurer to accept their request. Recognizing her knowledge about adventurers, Rent wonders if she's the one who posted the request. Elias confirms that she did and introduces herself to Rent. Deciding to discuss the request further, Rent acknowledges the difficulty of obtaining the plant. Elias explains that the plant is rarely found in shops and is usually expensive when available. Seeing Elias' genuine need for the plant, Rent asks for more details. Elias mentions they need to keep up a pretense, leaving Rent confused. Elias leads Rent to Lillian's room, where Lillian apologizes for the room's untidiness. Lillian, the orphanage's administrator, and a priestess of the Church of the Eastern Sky, introduces herself to Rent. Despite the modest reward offered for the request, Lillian expresses gratitude to Rent for agreeing to clean the cellar, as she cannot task the children with it due to monster spawns. As Lillian experiences a coughing fit, Elias advises her to rest while she briefs Rent on the remaining details. Exiting the room, Elias informs Rent that Lillian suffers from accumulated malice disease, explaining that Lillian, a user of divine powers, weakens her body each time she employs her abilities because she lacks sufficient strength. Rent was unaware of such a serious illness. Elias explains that a healer examined Lillian and suggested that she either undergo a saint's purification or receive a special medicine to be cured. Understanding that the dragon blood blossom is needed to create the medicine, Rent grasps the urgency of the situation. He realizes that Lillian is unaware of her illness, and Elias reveals that if she knew, she might step down from her role as a priestess. Rent understands that if that were to happen, Lillian would accept her condition, so he decides to assist Elias in obtaining the plant before it's too late. Elias had thought no one would accept the request, which is why she contemplated becoming an adventurer to retrieve the plant herself. Rent is taken aback by her revelation. Despite being skilled in mana ability, Elias admits she lacks time to train. Rent assures her that he will procure the flower, and she expresses her gratitude. However, he decides to clean out the cellar first. As Rent enters the cellar, Elias follows him despite his protest. Concerned for her safety, Rent offers her a dagger for protection. Elias is surprised to learn about the monsters in the cellar, particularly the unusually large monster rats. Rent activates his divine power causing the rat leader to command its fellow rats to flee. Despite this, the leader charges at Rent, who swiftly deflects its attack. The rat tries again, this time biting Rent's arm. Rent removes it and throws it to the ground. Suddenly, the rat falls under a spell, its appearance changing. 
Rent realizes he now controls the rat and gives it commands, surprising Elias. He decides to take the rat with him. Lorraine is astonished to see Rent with a rat on his shoulder. Rent explains that the rat is now his ally, similar to how vampires control others. Lorraine hadn't previously considered Rent's ability to control creatures using his blood. Rent decides to keep the rat, while Lorraine takes samples from it as payment for staying. She plans to study it further. Curious about its diet, she offers her finger, and the rat eagerly drinks her blood, similar to Rent. Rent decides to name the rat Black, but Lorraine prefers the name Edel, and surprisingly, the rat agrees with her choice. Lorraine wonders if Rent can communicate with the rat, but he explains that he can only sense its emotions. That night, Rent struggles to sleep, considering non-stop exploration of a labyrinth, but he knows it would raise suspicion among the guild members. Lorraine enters the room and offers Rent some food for his early departure the next day. Rent is surprised by Lorraine's cooking skills, but she reprimands him for underestimating her ability. She warns him about the dangers of the swamp and surprises Rent by knowing his destination. She asks if he plans to go alone, to which he replies affirmatively, confident that the swamp's poison won't affect him. However, she reminds him that he'll need a party to confront the dragon subspecies in the swamp. Rent explains that he doesn't intend to fight it and shows her the holy water he acquired. While Lorraine recalls rumors about holy water repelling monsters, she cautions Rent that it's not a foolproof solution. Rent assures Lorraine that he'll come up with a solution if the holy water doesn't work. He then begins to enjoy the meal, surprised by its delicious taste, which he hasn't experienced in a while. Lorraine reveals she added a drop of her blood to enhance the flavor and promises to prepare more for him upon his return. After taking a carriage to the swamp, Rent disembarks and the driver informs him of their scheduled pickup later in the day. As he enters the swamp, Rent wonders if Edel can withstand the poison, but he trusts his ability to purify the rat with his divinity if needed. Following a path left by previous adventurers, Rent encounters a group of goblins who attack him with arrows. Despite their strength and knowledge of weapons, Rent confidently defeats them with his superior skills and strength, swiftly taking down each goblin with his sword. Rent continues walking through the swamp, feeling content that his undead nature makes him immune to poison. He reflects on the idea of living as an undead indefinitely, as long as he can accept his altered appearance. Suddenly, the wooden path beneath him collapses, causing Rent to fall into the toxic swamp below. Seizing the opportunity, a swamp shark charges at him, prompting Rent to defend himself while Edel observes from a distance. Despite the surprise attack, Rent manages to defeat the sharks, though he becomes more cautious afterward. Disappointed in Edel's lack of concern, Rent picks up the rat and continues on guard. Meanwhile, Sheila expresses gratitude to Lorraine for the delicious food, unaware that Lorraine added her blood to Rent's meal to enhance its taste. Sheila is surprised that Rent, being undead, can consume regular food, but Lorraine clarifies the situation. Sheila then shares news about the guild's investigation into the events at Todd's village, where the villagers refused to disclose the adventurer's identity. Lorraine realizes that Sheila came to inquire if Rent was involved but she assures her that Rent won't reveal any information to avoid further suspicion, especially regarding a kidnapping incident. Sheila is amazed by Lorraine's knowledge about Rent, and Lorraine reveals that she has known Rent for a long time. Sheila questions why Rent aims to become the top adventurer, but neither she nor Lorraine knows his motivation. Lorraine explains that she has never asked Rent about it because adventurers are usually secretive about their past, and she didn't want to pressure him for an answer. When Sheila expresses concern about Rent facing monsters in the swamp, Lorraine assures her that the guild assigns requests based on an adventurer's ability. Sheila admits she chose Rent for the task because she trusts his capability. Lorraine echoes this trust in Sheila's judgment and believes that Rent can handle any trouble he encounters. Meanwhile, Rent finds himself pursued by swamp dragons and regrets purchasing low-quality holy water. As he reaches a dead end, he decides to confront the monster head-on. Despite jumping from a tree to attack, he is caught off guard when the monster releases poison. Rent slices through the poison and attacks the monster with his sword infused with mana. Although poison doesn't harm Rent, he doubts he can defeat the monster with just his mana. Attempting the mana spirit fusion technique fails against the monster. Surprisingly, Edel charges at the monster, using divinity powers, shocking Rent. As the monster swallows Edel, Rent prepares to rescue him, but the monster chokes and spits out Edel. Rent catches Edel and gets an idea to defeat the monster. Infusing his sword with divinity, Rent charges at the monster. Dodging the poison globs the monster spits, Rent strikes the monster with his divinity-infused sword, easily defeating it. Recognizing the monster's weakness to divinity, Rent decides to store it in his magic pouch since he can't carry it due to its size. Though expecting to fight the monster due to his bad luck, Rent is thankful Edel showed him how to defeat it. 
Planning to return later for rare materials, Rent discovers a large cluster of dragon blood blossom plants, purifying the surrounding air. Introducing himself, a man approaches Rent, surprised to find someone else in the swamp. Rent asks the man if he's alone, and the man confirms that he is. Rent warns him that the terrace swamp is dangerous for a person to be alone in, but the man explains he's prepared with items like poison nullifying items, holy water, and a map. He mentions he's after the dragon blood flower, and asks if there's an issue with him taking some. Rent assures him it's fine, and they both collect flowers. The man takes only one explaining his mistress needs the flower itself for medicine, as she's very ill. Rent hopes she gets better soon, and the man thanks him, revealing they were seeking someone to regularly bring them dragon blood flowers. He asks if Rent is an adventurer, and Rent introduces himself as a bronze-class adventurer. The man, surprised, still offers Rent the job. He introduces himself as Isaac Hart and plans to introduce Rent to his mistress later. Later, Rent is at the guild and tells Sheila he wants to hire a butcher. Sheila realizes Rent has defeated a terrace and takes him to the butcher. On the way, Rent explains about monsters dropping magic stones and being able to provide various materials when butchered. He's learned the basics but hires a specialist for more complex tasks. Sheila informs Dario they've brought a terrace, and Dario is impressed by the good condition of the monster and its undamaged shell, which is rare. Rent modestly explains he just didn't have much time. After handing over the terrace to Dario, Rent plans to visit the orphanage the next day. He thinks about feeling stronger, but attributes it to his undead body rather than personal improvement. He reflects on his past efforts and wonders if he can achieve mythical class if he returns to being human. The next day at the orphanage, Rent tells Elise he's completed the job. Elise calls in the healer and herbalist, Norman and Zambero, respectively. They are impressed by the quality of the prepared dragon blood flower and quickly begin making medicine. Norman suggests using the leftovers to treat other patients, and Elise agrees. Rent wonders if he wants more flowers, and the herbalist expresses appreciation for the offer. Rent willingly gives all the flowers he collected, refusing payment and asking them to use the flowers well. Norman thanks him, acknowledging the impact the flowers will have in saving lives. Umberto mentions their current inability to pay rent but assures him of help in the future if needed. Meanwhile, Edel talks with Pui Suri in the basement while Elise signs documents marking the end of Rent's job. She thanks him and shares her past aspiration to be an adventurer, which is now unnecessary thanks to Rent. Rent asks if she no longer desires to be an adventurer, but Elise confirms her desire is stronger than before. She expresses her wish to help people like Rent, and promises to assist him when needed. Rent mentions the trouble caused by small monsters in the basement and reveals that Edel's former gang will now protect them. Elise appreciates this and wonders if she can tame monsters when she becomes an adventurer. Rent advises her to start training early, mentioning guild classes and his availability for training. He encourages her to learn magic despite the cost, offering financial support without interest. Elise agrees to repay him with interest once she becomes an adventurer, and they strike a deal. Later, Rent visits Lorraine's house, where she agrees to teach Elise during her free time. However, she criticizes Rent for not understanding young girls' perspectives. Rent denies having many interactions with young girls, which angers Lorraine. She threatens to test a powerful spell on him to see how his body handles it. Ren compliments Lorraine, praising her youthfulness and fair skin, comparing her to the water fairies created by gods. He admires her as the epitome of a young lady. Lorraine becomes embarrassed and leaves to have some alone time, feeling affected by Ren's words. The next day, Ren goes to the guild, where Sheila hands him a letter from Isaac, requesting his presence for a job. Ren recognizes Isaac as possibly being a servant of the Lur household. Sheila explains that the Lur family is influential in Malt, and advises Ren not to offend them. Despite the potential danger due to his monster status, Ren decides to visit them. Meanwhile, at the orphanage, Umberto informs Lillian that she's sick with Malacula. Lillian expresses gratitude but hesitates to accept the expensive medicine made from dragon blood flowers. The Lees reassures her and tells her not to worry about the cost. Umberto reveals that an adventurer took the job from Elise for a low price, and Lillian realizes it was the same adventurer she met earlier. The scene shifts to Ren at the Lur Mansion, where he asks the guard for Isaac's whereabouts. The guard directs him inside, cautioning him about the maze within. Ren learns that the maze changes paths due to a special magic item, surprising him. The guard explains that the Lur family collects such magic items. Ren, intrigued by the prospect of receiving a magic item if he clears the maze, seeks advice from the guard who advises him not to rely on the sun. Entering the maze, Ren initially tries to use a magic map but realizes it won't work. Ren concludes that the map only works in labyrinths, but he remains undeterred, relying on his mental map to guide him. 
However, he soon finds himself lost in the maze. This bring an end to our episode 10. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. After a while, Rent arrives at a place where he encounters Laura, the daughter of the wealthy family, but he doesn't recognize her. Laura acknowledges Rent's determination and encourages him to keep trying harder. Rent expresses his willingness to exert more effort, and Laura advises him to continue in his current direction but mentions that he still has some time to complete the maze. Offering him a break, Laura suggests having tea together. They sit down and enjoy their tea. When Rent sits with Laura, she pours the tea, and Rent points out that she forgot to add the tea leaf. Laura explains that this teapot doesn't require tea to be added each time. It only needs to be added once during its initial use. Rent is impressed and asks where she acquired this magical tool. Laura informs him that there are two types of magical tools, those found in mazes and those crafted by artisans. This particular tool was discovered in a maze about 200 years ago and was valued at around 300 pieces of platinum. Rent was shocked to learn this because one piece of platinum could provide a comfortable life for him indefinitely. It appeared that the Rataru family was wealthier than the nobles in his village. Laura explained that such a piece deserved its high value because adventurers risked their lives delving into mazes to uncover such tools. Rent mentioned that despite the risks adventurers take, many magical tools often turn out to be worthless. After finishing his tea, Rent removed the mask from his face, surprising Laura with its magical properties. She inquired about its origin, and Rent revealed that an acquaintance purchased it for him from a stall in the malt village for just three copper pieces. Laura expressed amazement at the intriguing things found in malt and shyly asked Rent to give her the mask. Rent explained that he heard rumors about the Rataru family's fondness for collecting magical tools. Although Laura offered fair compensation for it, Rent didn't respond because he wanted to get rid of it, even though he couldn't remove it from his face. Upon remembering that the mask concealed his monstrous visage, Rent apologized to Laura, explaining that it was difficult for him to part with the mask. Laura felt disappointed because she desired the mask, but she understood its sentimental value to Rent. She apologized for her request, and Rent thanked her for the tea before heading to the Rataru family's house. Before he departed, Laura gave him a clue, warning him not to gaze at the sun. Rent found this suspicious, as it was the second time someone had cautioned him about it, leading him to realize there was a trap in the maze. He briefly glanced at the sun and then hurled stones into the sky, discovering that it wasn't the true sky but an illusion. This illusion was a technique called aerial transition. He pondered using this technique to return but concluded it might only work in one direction. He couldn't believe such a trap existed outside typical mazes. Ultimately, Rent understood that he had to start anew, embarking once again until he reached the Retiro family's house. Laura emerges to greet him, noting that he successfully unraveled the maze's secret. Rent credits the advice he received from someone, and she reveals herself as the lady of the house. Laura expresses her desire for them to be friends from now on, surprising Rent because this girl is the lady of the house. He introduces himself as an adventurer of the copper rank and explains that he came regarding the mission since he managed to overcome the maze. Laura acknowledges that very few can surpass that maze and promises him a reward for it. After entering the house and exploring it, Laura tells Rent that he can choose any magical tool from the ones the Retoro family possesses. Jokingly, Rent requests the tool used to create the maze. However, Laura apologizes, stating they cannot provide him with that tool. Rent then admits he was teasing her because that tool made him spin mercilessly in the maze, so he wanted to tease her a bit. Laura then takes him to a specific place and explains that these tools crafted by artisans are more efficient than others, but the most they can create are simple tools like this light. Rent was amazed by the mysterious tools he found, unsure of where they came from. Laura, who had carefully arranged them, confirmed they were all magical. She explained to Rent how the mazes were made, but even she didn't fully understand the magic behind them. Some of the tools were just scraps, Laura admitted, with no clear purpose. She tossed a bouncing ball to Rent a curious item she had collected despite not knowing its use. Laura then mentioned an airship she had seen in the western area, a huge craft powered by hot air. She showed Rent an invention modeled after the airship, but powered by magic instead. It could be controlled using magical mechanisms. Impressed, Rent expressed his desire to have the invention. However, he struggled with conflicting feelings, unsure if he should choose something practical instead. Next year, Laura noticed Rent's dilemma and advised him to focus on the invention and take control of it. She explained that it could provide him with an aerial perspective, as if he were flying inside it. Rent found it enjoyable, but noticed that it required a lot of magical energy. Laura clarified that it was just a model for convenience, and the real magical tool was found in one of the mazes. The airship was designed to imitate this magical tool, not the other way around. Since they couldn't understand the magic behind the airship, they used a different technology to operate it. 
Rent admitted that he initially thought it was just a game but realized its potential for exploration. Laura agreed but mentioned that it might not be able to fly long distances due to its reliance on magical power. Rent explained that based on his magical ability, he could use the tool for a few minutes. He decided to think more about it. Laura advised him to continue his research at his own pace. As they explored a new area, Rent noticed a magical tool and asked Laura about it. She confirmed that it lit up when something approached, even a mouse, making it both useful and potentially harmful. Rent then spotted a box that resembled an ordinary drawing. Laura encouraged him to press the button on the frame. Rent pressed the button, and monsters emerged from it. Then Laura showcased the invention in front of Rent, who was greatly impressed. She commented on the tool's cuteness and mentioned that Rent must have been surprised by the sound it made. Curiously, Rent placed his hands on a nearby box, causing a red beam to emit from it. This action worried Laura, prompting her to inquire with Isaac about the control device. Isaac responded, indicating that he might have placed it in a different location as a precaution. Suddenly, a giant creature attacked Rent. Acho, witnessing the scene, was shocked but managed to evade the creature's assaults. Rent pondered his course of action, wondering how to confront such a threat. He requested Isaac to hold on while he searched for the control device. Despite being struck by the giant again, Rent dodged the blow and hurriedly assessed the situation, realizing that the giant was only absorbing a small amount of magic from him. Asterisk informed him that the absorbed energy was merely for activation purposes. Laura elaborated, explaining that the creature became stronger by absorbing magic and surrounding material. Rent inquired about the possibility of harming the giant, to which Laura expressed her willingness but cautioned that defeating it wouldn't be easy. Undeterred, Rent attacked the creature, managing to break its arm. Recalling Laura's earlier advice about giants having a magical word engraved on their forehead, Rent remembered that altering this word slightly could change its meaning to death, prompting the giant to self-destruct. However, returning to reality, Rent found no such inscription on the giant's forehead. In desperation, the giant grabbed Rent and slammed him forcefully to the ground. Rent recalled Lauren's advice about separate control devices for starting and stopping the giant, feeling disheartened as he realized his options were limited, escape or defeat the giant. Back in reality, Rent rises from the ground and harnesses his magical power. He expresses reluctance to reveal this ability to others, but acknowledges that he has no alternative. As he begins to utilize his magical fusion ability, he is abruptly interrupted by the giant's attack. Suddenly, Laura intervenes, causing the giant to collapse and shatter into pieces. Laura and Isaac approach Rent and inquire about any injuries. Rent apologizes for endangering himself due to his oversight in organizing the storage of magical tools. Laura takes responsibility, stating that as the owner of these items, the blame falls on her. Hunter I also admits fault for mishandling the tools. Laura reassures them that she will instruct the workers to reorganize the room later. Emphasizing the priority of Rent finding the desired tool, Laura encourages him to continue his search. We then see Rent searching diligently, standing in front of his desk amidst various items. Laura explains to Rent that the materials they obtain from the monsters aren't magical tools but can serve as valuable resources for medicine or weapons. Rent approaches a bottle containing a substance and expresses great surprise, showing signs of admiration. Clara informs him that the liquid in the bottle is rumored to be vampire blood, which supposedly grants immortality upon consumption, though this claim remains unverified. In reality, there have been a few instances of people drinking vampire blood, but most suffered severe consequences, including insanity or death. Even those who survived faced paralysis, and any potential transformation into a vampire would result in immediate death. Despite the risks, some individuals still seek immortality through such means. Laura suggests that Rent could sell the vampire blood at a considerable price to rulers and kings. The scene shifts to Rent showing the tool he acquired to Lauren at her house, impressing her with it. Rent then demonstrates the tool's capabilities by flying it using the remote control. Lauren expresses surprise, having seen the original airship but unaware of its connection to this tool, which offers both freedom of control and an internal perspective, making it enjoyable to operate. Rent recalls his conversation with Isaac, who tasked him with obtaining the tool, offering it as a token of gratitude for accepting a challenging mission. Isaac assures Rent that he will be compensated with rewards stipulated in their contract for each successful completion. Isaac also provides Dragon's blood flowers, explaining that they will aid Rent in helping Lady Laura with her illness. Returning to reality, Rent shares the enjoyable conversation with Lauren and offers her the opportunity to try the tool. Lauren questions Rent about the vampire blood, and Rent admits to believing it could bring about a significant change if consumed. Lauren warns him of the dangers, citing records of tragic outcomes for those who drank vampire blood. 
Rent acknowledges the risks, but feels compelled to pursue the potential benefits for his existential evolution. Lauren pleads with him not to drink the blood, offering her support regardless of whether he remains a monster or not. Rent remains determined to achieve his goal of reaching the mithril rank, regardless of the time or challenges he may face. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Rent holds the vial containing vampire blood in his hand. Lorraine warns him against taking it, knowing it could jeopardize his life. Despite the risks, she's willing to accommodate him in her home, even though he's undead. His ambition is to reach the esteemed mithril rank as an adventurer, a feat he can only achieve by transforming into a human and adjusting to life as an undead. However, he fails to accomplish this goal, leaving him shocked and puzzled by Lorraine's concern. In that moment of uncertainty, Lorraine contemplates a question. She begins to wonder about Rent's intentions. Aware that Sheila has raised the issue and curious about his response, Lorraine realizes she must address the matter carefully, especially since revealing her true nature could deter Rent from staying. Despite her eagerness to learn more, she refrains from pressuring him internally. Desperate for answers, Lorraine decides to approach Rent with a question, feigning interest to pique his curiosity. She understands that Rent may choose not to answer, and she respects his decision. She genuinely wants to know why Rent is determined to achieve the mythal rank as an adventurer. Though she's unsure of the significance, she senses it's tied to Rent's childhood dream and wonders what drives him to pursue it now. Rent understands Lorraine's hesitation to delve into the matter further. He believes it's not appropriate to discuss it openly, but he's willing to share the details with her privately. He sees no reason to conceal the tragedy from her. In truth, his sole motivation for striving to become a mithril rank adventurer is driven by a desire for revenge. As Rent recounts his story, Lorraine is taken aback. He hails from the quaint village of Hathara, where his parents work as merchants, transporting goods to neighboring towns. However, at the tender age of five, Rent is separated from his family and is left behind when they relocate. He reunites with his sister, Jinlin, but their reunion is short-lived. While Jinlin eagerly anticipates exploring the outside world, Rent is apprehensive about encountering unfamiliar faces. Despite his reluctance, Jinlin is determined to fulfill her dream of visiting a mystical waterfall and a vanishing magical palace known as Grasen. Despite the risks, Jinlin is resolute in pursuing her aspiration, even expressing a desire to grow stronger to protect Rent. Reflecting on these memories brings Rent a sense of joy, particularly their mischievous antics under their grandmother's watchful eye. However, their idyllic reminiscence is shattered when they encounter the monstrous wolf, a creature far more terrifying and powerful than they could have ever imagined. The grandmother and parents meet their demise when the monstrous wolf creature overturns their carriage. Despite Rent and Jinlin's attempts to rouse their grandmother, she has already succumbed to her injuries by the time they realize the presence of another sinister creature lurking nearby. Although Rent's feet are rooted to the ground in fear, Jinlin remains composed and alert, firmly grasping his hand as she takes the lead in their escape. They dash away, the menacing wolf demon merely observing their flight without hindering them. Despite its ability to easily overtake them, they press on, driven by the urgency of survival. As they pause to catch their breath, a sudden cascade of stones traps their feet, revealing the manipulative intent of the wolf demon. It becomes evident that their escape serves merely as entertainment for the creature, allowing them to flee momentarily before it pounces, tearing them apart without mercy. In a desperate bid to shield Rent from harm, Jinlin pushes him aside, but she is met with the ferocious onslaught of the creature's claws, sealing her tragic fate. In his arms, Jinlin takes her final breath, remembering her vow to protect Rent at any cost. With her last words, she imparts to Rent the goal of becoming stronger granting him permission to fulfill her wishes before peacefully closing her eyes. As Rent mourns Jin Lin's passing, the menacing wolf demon advances towards him, intent on inflicting harm. However, Willfire intervenes, brandishing his sword to ward off the creature. Instructing Rent to stand back, Willfire engages in a fierce battle with the wolf demon, each combatant vying for dominance. With swift and calculated movements, Willfire and the wolf demon exchange blows, each aiming to prove their superiority and gain the upper hand. Seizing an opportunity, Willfire leaps into the air and thrusts his sword into the creature's body, questioning its intentions as it reels from the attack. Despite the wolf demon's injury, it considers fleeing upon hearing Willfire's words, recognizing the futility of further conflict. Meanwhile, Rent grapples with overwhelming grief at the loss of his family, unable to contain his anguish. In his sorrow, Rent expresses frustration towards Willfire's delayed arrival but Willfire acknowledges his mistake and extends his sincere apology for failing to save Rent's loved ones. Determined to seek vengeance, Rent resolves to undergo rigorous training to become stronger and confront the one responsible for bringing death to his doorstep. Willie Fired approaches Rent, 
and seizes the opportunity to inquire about joining the ranks of adventurers like him. Upon realizing that Rent is only five years old and cannot officially register until he turns 15, Willie advises him to learn about herbs and undergo basic training in the meantime. Impressed by Willie's helpfulness, Rent appreciates the accurate guidance provided. Furthermore, Willie extends a formal introduction and expresses a desire to meet again in the future. Grinning with determination, Rent decides to pursue his dream of becoming an adventurer, understanding the challenges of surviving without family and giving himself a name to live by. In a sudden change of heart, Lorraine encourages Rent to consume vampire blood to level up as an adventurer, even offering to bury him properly if he were to pass away during the transformation. Despite the potential dangers involved, Rent is undeterred by the prospect of death, driven by his determination to achieve his goals. Setting aside his fears, Rent swiftly consumes the vampire blood, though he notices no immediate changes. Suddenly, he begins to scream in agony, feeling as though he is drowning in a sea of pain. Concerned for Rent's well-being, Lorraine watches on anxiously as he endures the intense ordeal. Before venturing into the labyrinth, Sheila warns them about the potential dangers that lie ahead. She emphasizes that if they encounter a creature too powerful to handle, they should retreat and not risk their lives needlessly. Life is precious, and they should value it above all else. Upon waking up, Rent finds himself floating on water, feeling unrested due to the turmoil of his transformation into a monster. Despite his struggles with sleep, he reflects on the challenges of his evolution each transformation bringing intense discomfort. As he opens his eyes, he is met by Lorraine, who reveals that he has turned into a vampire, a revelation that shocks him. Despite his transformation, Rent's appearance remains unchanged, but he now possesses wings on his back, a unique trait for a vampire. Lorraine examines him closely, noting his red eyes, a common feature among vampires. Realizing the potential for secrecy with his human-like appearance and ability to blend in, Rent feels a sense of relief. Lorraine, emboldened by recent events, expresses her admiration for him and gently touches his face with her delicate hands. And so, as their journey comes to an end, Rent and Lorraine share a moment of understanding and acceptance, marking the conclusion of this captivating anime series. Subscribe to the channel for more exciting new anime adventures.